Hello, drummers and other creatures. Here we are uh, with another chatty thing. I haven't done any like drumming related videos in a little while for various reasons, uh, rooms and things. But today I'm very excited to be talking with a very, very old friend of mine uh, who is also the bass player with the band uh, you might have heard of called The Pretenders. And uh, just a very, I don't know, multi talented, uh, incredibly capable musician, probably the best musician I've ever played with. Uh, the one yeah. that <laughs> Hello, Dave. Hello. You're very kind. I'm good at plate spinning. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, good at plate spinning. yeah, yeah, but like a really tip top plate spinner, though, I have to say. Yeah, I'll take um, that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we know each other from like going to college together about a thousand years ago uh, when you were like an up upstart Hailsham's number one uh, Ibanez playing shreddy guitar enthusiast, <laughs> teenager person. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, go on. 16. Yeah. Just yeah. left school. And we played quite a lot together at that time, learned how to do some recording. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, eventually you went to the big world and sort of became a session guitarist. Um, yeah. And, and you're playing bass and, and singing as well with a lot of bands. Uh, can you give us an idea of some of the bands that you've been uh, been associated with? Yeah. So, so sort of, I moved to London and then... Yeah, uh, my first sort of proper session gig was with a guy called Jonathan Jeremiah. Yep, and he's he does a kind of Cat Stevensy, folky stroke, soul kind of thing. And I play guitar with him, and he, he's still going. We're still making records together, so that we're sort of five albums in. Yeah, so he was. And you playing. did a lot of live touring with him as well as uh, studio recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was the guy that got me up my day job, mm -hmm. and then from that on, it sort of led to playing with other people that were associated actually with the same small group of people. Yeah. So there was kind of a hub. There used to be a vintage guitar shop called Angel Music, and that was kind of my my hub to everybody, actually. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah, through that shop. I met Jonathan. I, I, I played in a band called Colorama. Uh, and there's a guy, a guy from that that's called Carmen Ellis, and he he was in The Pretenders as well. He was the oh. piano player in The Pretenders, and... So everything's been slight, been connected. <laughs> yeah, uh, back with Young Gun Silver Fox. Yeah, as well. Yeah, with producer Sean Lee, that sort of been playing with them for about eight years. Um, yeah, lots of little things really. It's all. Yeah, uh, Edwin Collins. I did that for a little while, playing guitar, and yeah. then started playing more band and gigs and yeah. And so you sort of found yourself so getting a lot of stuff through just being. I guess hanging out somewhere where there are a lot of musicians and yeah, there was always a feel at angel music of um, a sort of network a very particular network of people. Cause even, uh, you know, I used to go up there and do bits and bobs and there was all this same sort of characters going around. So through that uh, yeah. particular connection, it opens up all the possibilities. Yeah. It, there's definitely a, a the, there was a community of people that were sort of, you know, if they needed someone and they knew you, they could give you a call. And then we, you know, we did a good job. You get a call back, you know. So it was still, you know, it was still on your own merits as well, you know. You yeah. definitely knowing somebody helped, but then you know, go and do a good job. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I remember yeah. there were times when it seemed like you were playing with like five different bands, and in some band you were playing bass and singing backing vocals. Another band you were playing guitar. Uh, sometimes you know, and you seem to be able to like retain lots of uh, sets, I guess, in your mind. So yeah, maybe yeah. Why don't we go back and sort of think? So uh, my my angle of interest being the the like learning process as well as how you sort of uh, just sort of be a musician. I guess there's a lot of uh, chit chat all about uh, I don't know how to play this and technical exercises and every musician. If you're a guitarist, you need to do these exercises and so on and so forth. And um, I think a lot of that can put people off. So I really like yeah. sort of thinking about how different people have gone through the process of becoming successful musicians, whatever that means. Um, so yeah, what, what was your background in uh, in learning the guitar originally? You came from a musical family, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Dad, dad uh, was a sort of part-time musician. He played two, three nights a week, at, like social clubs and hotels and I, I sort of we got dragged along to those gigs as a family so from the get-go i was around him doing it and he's a big influence actually he doesn't always realize <laughs> i tell him like it's your fault 
you know, it had a big impact on me. Yeah, you know, yeah, totally idolised him and what he was doing. Actually, you know, and your dad played so the that set played the bass of son, but he played guitar as well. So he started out as a guitar player, and you know, there's a whole story of how he became a bass player by accident, and you know, it's a lot of bass but, players, uh, so, players by accident. Yeah. That's a whole other podcast. I wonder what that, you know. <laughs> but um yeah, so that 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 was the start of it. And then, you know, we it was a very musical home. There was always music on. So I grew up with rock and roll and all the stuff that my dad was into. Beach Boys, Little Richard, Elvis. So that that had a profound effect on me. I still love that music. It's probably still my favorite music. Um music. so yeah, I wanted to play guitar. I, I I dabbled with drums, I dabbled with a few things, and then came back to guitar properly at the age of 10. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mum got a call book for me. Dad started to show me stuff so, as soon as I showed an interest, because I think he was, he was a bit unsure if I actually wanted to do it or not. And then, you know, I, I couldn't play things I was trying to play. I then sort of had a hissy, can I have guitar lessons? And then my dad got, eventually got me guitar lessons for... Right. Couple of years. Remember your first it was to go straight into um, electric guitar, or no? I had a, a nylon strung, cheap nylon strung acoustic that actually had been my sister's. So my older sister played for a bit, so I inherited that guitar. Yeah, and that yeah, that's what I played uh, for a few years, and eventually my dad bought me an electric guitar, and, that was, and that's when I started having guitar lessons. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I did that for a few years. And you had but lessons with I, a particular teacher, if I recall. I did, yeah. A guy called Mike Hutchinson in Eastbourne. And he was, you know, he was brilliant, amazing, amazing musician. Um quite an oddball. He lived in a tiny little house in uh <laughs> in like a kind of council estate and you know, you'd open the door, he he just walk around with his guitar all the time. He was, you know, completely obsessed. Uh outstanding musician. And he definitely set me on a, I think for me, he was the right teacher for me. Mm -hmm. So in hindsight, I could totally understand why, what worked for me with him. You know, he, he didn't teach me. I didn't learn how, how to read music. I didn't learn. I learned some theory within the context of playing the guitar, but certainly not schooled in, in music theory, but mm -hmm. he, he got me playing. He could see that I wanted to play and I had a absolute love for music. And that's what he encouraged. He encouraged that side and also the independence you would always say have a go at working out stuff and i remember the first lesson i had with him the first thing he said find some other people that play music and, and get in a band put a band together the best thing you can do is put a band together you know so that he really did instill some like i think really important stuff that i would tell others actually i would pass that on yeah really get into a band i mean i i remember when we first played together in college um, there was an immediate just sense of someone who knows how to play with other people, which is yeah. really not, um, it's not all that common, actually, that feeling of just knowing how to play together. And I think we we were doing those sort of silly projects and we could just knock something out because we just sort of knew how to listen to each other and yeah. Uh, yeah. just sort of play something. We knew forms and stuff. And I yeah, I don't remember sort of in any official way learning that. It was just, uh, yeah, it was that sort of awareness of, of listening to music um so did you i mean did you get that thing you know so i was just saying i think it was it was, a, it was that thing I'd, I'd grown up listening to loads of music that i didn't know how to play and then i had a teacher who could stop he, he taught me things but he also said go away and keep listening like you've been doing keep trying to work it out and it was i i would have these moments of he'd teach me a particular thing a technique or whatever it was and then suddenly it would make a load of other stuff make sense that i'd not understood for years i'd listen to a piece of music and go oh it's that thing and then i'd be able to play it yeah so he really did encourage the kind of self-learning as well it wasn't just he was teaching me he was teaching me how to teach myself and, yeah, and to you like know that. noted the thing you know join yeah, the dots it mostly <laughs> by ear because in in those days you didn't have an iphone there that you could like record something your teacher was doing um no, you know, it by ear if you weren't doing a sort of reading based yeah. thing yeah no, no I, I used to have a, a little tape recorder it was all just tapes listen to music keep rewinding it yeah try and sense of it again you know that in itself was an education it, you, you train your ear in a different way doing that though you know it's um 
And so what about like the technical side of things? Did you learn sort of th those sort of exercises and drills that people encourage to do a lot of the time? Or was it very much focused yeah. on, on lots of learning songs specifically? No, he, he definitely was quite focused on technique. Um, you know, one of the first things he did, I remember the first lesson I had with him, he asked me to show him everything, all the chords, you know, for what, what I knew basically. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I played all, all you know, standard chords, cowboy chords, <laughs> bar chords. Um, and then, yeah, he then taught me scales. We started off with major minor, you know, all, all the basic things. Yeah. Teaching me how to play single note guitar playing, you know, yeah. as opposed to sort of rhythm. Yeah. All those things. You, you didn't. I, I, oh, yeah. It, I'd already do that. Yeah. So uh, you kind of knew the What's rhythm. that? I said you didn't miss any of the rhythm stuff. Yeah, well, I, no, I think that 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 I, you know that's what I did learn from my dad and did learn from the, already having that sort of environment of music. I'd always been banging along on an acoustic guitar even when I didn't know any chords. From yeah. like, very young age, I've still got that first guitar. Actually, fun enough, I've been passing it on to my children, but I've got a guitar from when I was six. Right, it's a it's a miniature nylon string, and I sit and bash along. Yeah, you know so. I think yeah, that, that developed earlier. So that was quite a good thing. I had that before I went for lessons. He taught me how to play, you know, lead guitar. That's, a, you know, yeah, electric lead guitar. That, you know, that's what I started out on because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So you'll see, you know, Johnny B. Good, Layla, all, all, all the famous guitarists, you know. All that <laughs> stuff. And, and um, like, when did you actually start playing with bands then? How how soon did you get? Yeah, a band. So I started those lessons with eleven. It was it wasn't until I was fourteen actually. So I'd stopped having lessons with him, and then I then ended up in a band of school friends. Yeah, you know. And after yeah. Mike, did you have any uh, sort of extra tuition after that? After you finished uh, having lessons with him? No, you haven't taken lessons since then. Do you ever? Do you ever fancy having some lessons? Or yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So I I still have a burning, and I'm going to do it. It's my lifelong dream to live in spain for a bit and learn from manco learn proper guitar proper proper guitar yeah, yeah. Uh, Pat de lucia is my favorite guitar player ever yeah. probably yeah it'd be him and hendrix mixed into one little thing yeah yeah i'd, I'd be very happy so <laughs> that I, i'm gonna do it it's gonna happen i am gonna go back well the um, hendrix stuff is kind of there isn't it so it's only the spanish bit you need to add to the mix yeah but uh, you know i talk about it a lot to you know, my partner, who's also a musician and musician friends, actually, you know, I would like to, to learn more. I'd actually like to learn more theory, but it's hard. I find it hard now. I, you know, it wasn't easy back then as well. It wasn't my natural kind of environment. I was much more about, I just want to play and hearing it. And yeah. So, I mean, I, so, okay. I, I remember again, when we, we're doing stuff together and when we when we were working together recording things and doing whatever the hell that was um <laughs> I, there was all that and sort of noodling about and and i remember when when we had ideas or when we had to sort of achieve some sort of musical product or whatever it was um you always had something at your fingertips and it's, it's something that i i've not really come across with um I, I can't think of any other situation where I've played with someone who's just like, oh, uh, you know, ah, uh, we need something that sounds a bit like Hawaii Five O, you know, and I don't know. You, you'd always seem to come up with something. Oh, we want this. This needs a bit more Rolling Stones vibe, you know. Oh, this is a bit more Hendrixy or whatever, whatever. And we got into the whole thing of uh, fiddling around with guitars and amps and so on and so forth. But just yeah, just seem to have like an amazing uh, flexibility to uh, explore different styles and, and always produce something that sort of fit in, in different circumstances. I don't know. So, you know, we could make something that sounded convincingly funky. We could make something that sounded convincingly blues, convincingly Jimi Hendrixy, 60s, classic rock, whatever styles we needed to, to do. You always seem to have yeah. some sort of idea of how to produce something that sounds like that. Um, is that, is that sort of part of the benefits uh, that you bring to the table now as a, as a session is it is it right definition a session guitarist? Is that the is that the choice? Well, yeah, I think it is. I don't, know. I don't know any other way to describe it. All I can add to that is that sort of I've had I've ended up with sort of long term gigs, session gigs. So they're not you know I can't, I'm in the band, but I'm not you know I'm not on the tin, as yeah. it were. So yes, they started out as 
being hired to just be a guitar player, but then you end up sort of involved in it. In, you know, you ingratiate yourself in a different way over over time. Mm-hmm. So they've been long long term gigs, which has been great. But yeah, it's a session yeah. still. And yeah, to answer your question, def- I think the whole thing of being able to sort of play, understand the style, it just came through more and more listening. Because I think I definitely, when I started out having the guitar lessons, it was like sport for me. As soon as he started teaching me scales and it was about, you know, can I learn to play fast? Mm-hmm. I went down, definitely went down that route for a few years. Um, it, you know, <laughs> and it, it had to come out of that. Yeah, and I think, funny enough, like playing with you, you, you know, going to that, doing that rock music course, didn't we? And I was, I'd only just turned sixteen, left school, yeah. and that was an education. Just the the fact that being around different musicians, different people, different ages, because it was a mixed age course, wasn't it as well? So yeah. that was a tough well, life. I was quite 16. elderly, yeah, by that time as well. You know, I'm not going to mention it. You're not elderly, but you are. You are. You know, you're right. one of my peers. <laughs> not by much, but you know. I, I was in a situation where I looked up to people and I was like, okay, you know, and learned loads from everybody, basically, you know, and just got back to listening to music again and not just playing guitar. Cause I think I went down a route of, I just want to be a great guitar player. Yeah. And well, at some the point that's, you sort of came across as that are sort of like widdly, um, you know, look, look how fast I can do this in your mouth. That's what, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah. You know, that was, that was the aim. Yeah. But you really changed, though. You didn't. At some point, you d- you didn't stick just in that well, mode. Well, I actually, think what really changed things was when actually you and I started working in that studio. Yeah. No, because you start recording, and you go, "Well, th- my yellow Ibanez doesn't sound like that record." Yeah. And it was an immediate thing, wasn't it? You know, I remember us recording, going, "Why does the guitar not sound good?" Oh, because it's not the right guitar. Hey, and then you know, the telly and, even needs a telly. I know some people will disagree with me. If we were pl- making Steve Vai records or Satrona yeah. records or anything like that, then the Ibanez is the right guitar. Yeah, absolutely. We weren't doing that, were we? We were, you know, we were making all sorts of things where you needed a, the sound of a Telecaster or the sound of a Strat or, you know, I know it sounds boring, but it's the, the fact is, if you want it to sound like that, you use the thing that sounds like that. You don't, you're not going to make an Ibanez sound like that, you know. And then that definitely sent me back on the route of, oh, well, I like that music. I like that guitar sound, and that's not this. And you can't play everything. You don't play the same on different guitars. You know, mm-hmm. they just they, they, you know the instruments are different tools. Yeah. If I wanted to go and play, you know, a heavy metal gig, then I yep, yeah, I'd get an Ibanez out with a Floyd Rose trim, you know, low action light strings, and go and shred to my heart's content. <laughs> but you know, you're not going to do that on a, you know, I don't know, a Fender Telecaster with heavy strings playing with a clean sound. You know, they're just different different things yeah and it's really yeah. yeah it wasn't really um uh a learning i mean i didn't know anything about guitars at the time anyway i still don't actually but um yeah. you know I, th- I, think, <laughs> I mean apart from the else being able to hang out at a vintage guitar shop must have added quite a lot to the, the oh, but again that, that, there's been quite a few sort of game changing moments there was obviously us working in the studio for two years where we got to just learn how to record and, you know, our good friend, you know, JP and Frank, they used to bring amps that they were trying to build. They had stuff that didn't work, things that blew up, yeah. you know, but we got to have a go with everything. Yeah. That first part of the education. Yeah. But, you know, you know what I mean? Like I was saying, I was actually talking to someone about this the other week, you know, we got to a habit of on a Monday listening to a bunch of records. Do you remember that? Where we'd actually put yes, on records. I've got the tinnitus to remind me every day. But yeah, because... Yeah, <laughs> and that was but we, we and we listened to some terrible i remember listening like when if i come across like avril lavigne i remember sitting yeah. there listening to josh freeze and just going this is this is incredible and the um american idiot came out and we'd listen to those things and lots lots of rage against the machine as well wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah I, I remember that and uh, a Nickelback record, the first Nickelback record, and an Avril Lavigne record, just sounding astonishing, blowing everybody else's record out the water sonically. Yeah, it was like quite something. I still haven't quite, you know, got over. Yeah. I really remember it. It was quite a vivid yeah. thing. <laughs> going, I too. Wow, I think it's Avril Lavigne. Yeah, yeah. I've got yeah. Rage Against the Machine. I think were two of the things that we'd listened to a lot. 
Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Coming to work in the morning and just sticking some horrifically loud shit on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like so having, 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 and having the time to just like set up mics and move things around and actually just really hearing that stuff sound different. And, yeah. and also that every day we'd go in, you don't play the same. No. And we were getting different results out of ourselves doing stuff. So that was, you know, and then, yeah, I moved to London and then, you know, our friend Frank, he was working in a guitar shop, vintage guitar shop, repairing stuff, repairing old amps. So I went and played all the old amps that he was repairing. You go next door, it's all old guitars. You get to have a go on pretty much everything that you could ever dream of. Yeah. Um, um, it just changes, changes your perspective, changes everything. You suddenly, you know, go, okay, I've got some idea of a wider, you know, it's a wider spectrum of everything, isn't it? You know. So uh, how did you sort um, of? Um, yes. oh. Sorry, I got caught up in the lag there. I was, I was right. going to say, yeah, I was sort of, yeah. sort of jumping to like how how then you sort of evolved into being an active live musician from the point of view of I think we were just very busy doing any gig for for quite a lot of time. Obviously, you know, we've done a bunch of gigs together in the last few well, not the last few years, but before anyway. But, yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, there's the you know even okay. um, even. I don't know. I think a lot of musicians go out and play any gig basically. And so sometimes you, you're just going and playing for beer. Sometimes you're playing with a big name in a, in a sort of large hall and so on and so forth. And there's, do, do you find that you have like a equal amount of enthusiasm for playing gigs, no matter what the circumstances are, or do you feel like the more experience you've got playing in like a big venue, does that change your um, sort of sense of like then going and playing at the blues bar or something like that? Or no, no, it doesn't. Because you know, if it's some, I want to go. And, if I want to play with somebody because I like the music, then I will go and play anywhere. And and to be honest, you know, bigger shows, smaller shows, it's, it, they are the same thing. Weirdly, um, you know, it's definitely more about. I, I, you know, I've been quite cheesy with who I who, who I would play with. Actually, you know, I think I I, I took a definite path. I I probably could have played with other people and gone down all different routes and done more gigs maybe and maybe I don't know, been a bit more successful. <laughs> but, you know, I I think, you know, everything that I sort of came my way were things that I wanted to be involved in. And that, and that's what I ended up being, like I said earlier on, long term gigs. I still play with everyone that I've been playing with now since two thousand and ten. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that still it's nice involved to have those long, in long relationships, isn't it? But uh, you know, you get really to know. Yeah, people. I think it was important for me as well because you know it's about the music. It isn't about you know just you know playing as a session person for whoever. Yeah, I always wanted you know I, I you know I you know my dream was to be in you know like a lot of musicians' dream being a band and make it you know your yeah. band with your you know so. It's, you know, true to form. I still like playing. I want to be in a band. I want to be part of of the the group. You know, yeah. not just there playing. You know, willy nilly. You know, <laughs> it's a no. uh, so the uh, you sort of you, you've you've ended up now. I mean, you're you're in a very famous band now, or you're part of a very famous band, uh, and it's like it's the Pretenders. I mean, to me. I don't know. It was quite a big, a big thing when I was a kid. I used to listen a lot. Um, I was a huge fan in the eighties. Uh, I was very lucky to come and see you playing in Camden, which was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I wasn't yeah, meant to quite, good. yeah. But how it just sounded like the Pretenders. It really seems like the same thing. Um, you know, not to bring up anybody's name, but some <laughs> some people have had very long careers. Uh, maybe they, um, you know, they've lost some of their mojo. A little bit but you know the pretenders just sound amazing um it was it was great i i like listening to uh i know the drums in a lot of the songs quite well and it's quite nice listening to how the drummer's yeah. just doing his thing there so it's kind of it's right but but they're not you know there's a lot of uh uh emphasis now on people learning and trying to copy everything on a record and i'm thinking you know well he's 
kind yeah. of doing the right sort of thing um but also it's not exactly the same as, as on the record because you just kind of know what to play how, how did that work for you like when when you got this gig uh did you feel like you had to imitate everything exactly or did you get instructions or were you sort of left to just kind of work out what what the stuff was to do because when you're playing something that's so well known i don't know if it has a different weight yeah to it. i uh, well i always think that you should learn the thing verbatim I do think that's important, like, you know, especially like for me coming into the pretenders, you know, it's got a long history mm -hmm. and the songs are the way they are. And what's great, you know, when I listen to it and the, the bass playing is great on, especially love the early stuff. I, I really like the first, you know, the original lineup of Honeyman Scott and, you know, that's the pretenders yep. to me as a yep. fan. And I, you know, in my head, it's like, I want to approach it that way well, you know and i think the lineup of the band we we sound much like the earlier version of the band because we're all rock and roll musicians james on guitar is an astonishing guitar player and he's got that same attitude you just think that i'm pretty sure james Hunnam and scott would have had it's, it's quite it's, it's quite wild and in the moment and you know yeah again you know it's in keeping with the attitude of the band i think you know and for me so learning the bass lines what they were and what they are how they exist is really important but then obviously naturally things change a little yeah i think that's probably what you've observed in like chris's drumming in the band it's like he is playing it like the record but it, then he's also imparting a bit of himself and there is always room to do that but still be respectful to the to the music because the music yeah, yeah. exists it sounds you know. the same but it's not exactly the same yeah 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 but you you, you you're not you know you're not trying to create a different version of it you know you're totally showing respect to what it is and yeah. and the song you know, you're serving the song so it's no point going you no know, me as a bass player suddenly thinking that what i'm doing is going to you know what, what am i trying to impart on it I, these aren't my songs you know i didn't write this I'm, i yeah. wasn't in that band you know so did you sit down and 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 literally just learn everything off the records and is it yeah yeah quite it's quite funny so it's been learned sort of in real time on the gigs right. especially or sometimes just a song in that i don't really know yeah. um so you know it's quite dangerous you know it's fun it's good there's there's still an element of not always you know she keeps you on your toes yeah don't always going on but uh yeah definitely i've, I've sat down and learned the things that i've been asked to learn and then yeah it's it's evolved a little yeah and then just, you've, you've been, i mean have you been touring the first half of the year well we're just sort of into i i think you've been quite uh, i was supposed to be actually things got moved a bit because uh you know uh they just rescheduled some gigs uh because there was some surgery and stuff the boss had to have some surgery on her leg so we're, we're just about to get going again actually start rehearsals next week oh right okay so that's and then good. we've yeah then we've got a bunch of festivals in june and in july we go off on tour with the Foo Fighters in America. Oh, fantastic. And then we do Rome gigs. Uh, and then we come back and do a European tour oh, and then the a UK Josh tour. Freeze so now, is that right? They have got the same Josh Freeze, yes. I have I have seen them with Josh Freeze and met Josh. We did we did a festival in last summer. I'm just gonna shut the door. It's raining. <laughs> um, did you tell him how we enjoyed his performance in uh, Avril Lavigne? No, I haven't yet. <laughs> Not yet had a job. I will, I'm, I'm hope, sure you've been hope, impressed. Yeah, hope to be able to chat to them more. But yeah. you know, hung out with Dave Grohl a little bit. He yeah. got up and played with Glastonbury. He guested on. Yeah, the I tracks. saw that. I, it really blew my mind actually seeing you there. Well, oh, first, all, you from the side. All, all of it blows my mind. Johnny you know, Marr, was I, Johnny Marr there as well. Am I remembering that? That blew my yeah, mind. It was a bit mad. Well, it's like that in rehearsals. You know, I have, I have moments of like suddenly going, "Oh God, it's Chrissy Hine there." Um, you know, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a fan. Yeah, fans, and, and that doesn't go away, you know. I, you, you know, you count count your lucky stars. Really, I'm very lucky to and privileged, and feel very privileged to be involved in such a thing. And you know, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, you know, we're all very proud of you. You know, as you know. <laughs> oh, very kind. But you know, and I still like. We, so we haven't done a show in a while, and I'm now terrified about going out and doing a gig again because you know. Oh really? <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I always have going straight onto a very big stage. Yeah, well, it's just, I, I think, you know, I always personally feel like I've forgotten how to do anything. You yeah. know, if, if, if there's a little gap, or it's, you know, 
it's, it's quite a good thing. I'm, you know, not, you no, know, it's not overconfidence there. It's, uh, it's good to sort of, you know, realize it, things for what they are. It, you know, you, it's a human thing. You do get nervous or you do, you know, when, when I'm playing all the time, I'm not nervous at all. Uh, but just because you're used to the situation and you get in the groove, you know, I think, you know, different with different people. Yeah. Once I'm in the thing, I'm very focused and it's, and it's fine, you know. But, you know, I have a bit of self doubt sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. it's always good, though. I, I think that's good. I, I think, yeah, being overconfident isn't, isn't a good idea, actually. Right. No, you need confidence when you're doing it and, and, and you need to also tell yourself when you know you know something, you know it. Otherwise, otherwise you've got no chance, you know, you, you, you just wouldn't do it. But, um, it's good to, you know, when you haven't done, you know, when you've been away from it for a bit and you come back into it, as it inevitably happens with gigs, you know, like you do long periods of playing and you feel really good and you come away and, and you don't do any shows for a couple of months, you know. Yeah. Do you, you ever it. find yourself in that thing where, uh, you know, a lot of the time when I'm playing, you're, you're sort of counting in and you're suddenly going, I've got absolutely no idea what I meant to do when I get to four. Does that still yeah. happen in this sort of situation or is it because, because like all the gigs I've played involve zero rehearsal and I suppose you get a lot of rehearsal time. Um, yeah, I did, I have to say this has been the first gig for a long time when it is, we actually do have blocks of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. So it's been amazing because actually that, that does really help because rehearsing, you know, even when those moments happen, the hands just know what to do because you have rehearsed. It is there. You know, I think that, that monkey brain thing at, that coupled with not rehearsing is a proper disaster because you will go, I don't even know where I am or what song this is. Whereas at least <laughs> I haven't had a couple of weeks of rehearsals. You have drilled thing. Yep. You know, that, that is a, you know, that, that's one thing I have to say. Yeah. It, it, you should rehearse. It's good to rehearse if you can. Good to rehearse. That's fine. To, to, ev to everyone, <laughs> you know, you should rehearse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, practice. You should, practice does, you know, if, even if you're the most talented person and you're, you know, and you can always remember everything or whatever, practice is just, it, it's an, it's an extra thing for when those moments happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you find, are there any spontaneous moments when you're doing this kind of gig or like with the Yeah, like, yeah. Well, I think I just, I touched on it where, you know, there's been, because I'm, I'm quite new to the band, there's been times where Chris, he just pulls out a song I've not actually ever played or might have played it once in a rehearsal. Oh, wow. And then you're like, oh, okay. Or somebody in the audience has shouted out something and she'll just launch into it. And it's brilliant, actually. So there's been some funny, funny moments of the whole band, even just not, not really knowing okay. a song. Cool. You know? It's kind of fun to still have that in, um, in that big setting. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's a real strip that band. It's Chrissy on rhythm guitar singing. There's James playing lead guitar, me on bass and a drummer, no backing tracks. So, you know, it's, it's bare bones. And yeah, and gigs, things go wrong. We've had a few gigs, we're all on the in-ears where the in-ears have gone. And that's quite interesting when, you, you know, we're, we're, yeah. When we've been running different systems, sometimes we've got amps, sometimes we don't have amps. So when it's a completely silent stage and that happens, it's pretty um, hairy. <laughs> what what um, do you do in that sort of situation? Well, the thing is, we've just carried on playing. Oh, okay. And that's the attitude of the band. Everyone just carries on playing, even, you know, so that I like. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. But it's good that there's some yeah. things that keep you on your toes, I guess. Well, it's just, it's, and it's, and it's real life. You know, the reality is, you know, once you start gigging as a musician, things go wrong that you have no control of. We had one gig, we were playing a big, big festival where the photographer unplugged the monitor desk with his foot by accident, unplugged the, the, the cable. So we had like two salt. We played with no, you know, you're just hearing what's out there in the festival. You know, oh, these things you can't plan for. You can't plan for those things, you know? So. Absolutely. Just to, yeah. So, we, we, you know, the thing, when you're in it, you're in it. You can't escape. When you're in a gig, <laughs> you go with it, don't you? You know, not to go to the end. So when the in ears yeah. go, well, how do you monitor yourself on the silent stage then? Or are you literally, you're listening to the, yeah. the house PA at that point? House PA, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to be able to play like a second behind yourself or ahead. Yeah, it's a funny, like your heart sinks. <laughs> it's a, it's a, there's a mild cardiac arrest, and then you go, <laughs> I've, got, I've got to carry on. Yep. But, you know, but, but these things happen on any gig. So, you know, like, you know, we could be playing in the pub, and then suddenly the power goes out, or 
I remember yeah. I used to play a gig in a social in a development club as a teenager, and if you played too loud, the electricity cut out because they had a attenuator. Yeah. You know, so that's your first, my first kind of experience of anything like that, where you just go, "Oh, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to stop? Do I carry on? What's going to happen?" And then event, you know, just get on with it, don't you? But yeah, it is good to be in those situations where you sort of shit yourself a bit, and then you have to uh, just go with the flow and keep going. Yeah. And also, you know, it's the same even with making mistakes. I remember being when we played together. I have I used to get really quite upset about making a mistake or playing anything wrong. Yeah, and I. I've realized I put far too much pressure on myself. There's a good amount of pressure and there's a bad thing. And at some point, I may, I may remember that a way. certain scenario where we'd be playing. And if someone made a mistake, a certain member of the band used to scowl and uh, <laughs> raise eyebrows and stuff and, and all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Aim, so. But yeah. So, um, cool. And, uh, and, and sort of aside from the like wild rock and roll lifestyle of being pretenders bass, uh, man, uh, you're also kind of a folk musician as well, which is like a whole other oh, side of you. Something. Well, well over the years, I've been playing different stuff. Actually, it's funny. I started out playing rock rock music, and it still is kind of. I've come full circle. Yeah. So I'm, you know, it's good. It's like That's possibly back where I should be. Yeah. But uh, your other half called Edda Letsy, Yeah. If I pronounce. Yeah, it. it's named after our boat. That we're, yeah. I'm sat on the, uh, we, you know, we, we've been on, we were on the boat just before lockdown was when we moved on it. And then lockdown happened and Anna, she's a, she's a singer songwriter herself and you know, session singer. And we had no work obviously. And then we sort of, we'd been talking about doing something together and we started writing some bits together. We had different ideas. It started out as being more of a kind of like, 50s kind of sun records thing acoustic thing and then suddenly took on a whole different uh <laughs> thing once I start recording recordings with a hell of a lot of ambience um, yeah 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 no it suddenly then took on a whole different thing like a 60s slightly psychedelic kind of nancy sinatra lee hazelwood sort of vibes yep um yeah and then got a little record here just just released it actually so, you know, we'd been making it for a little while. It was definitely a, you know, when I say a labour of love, and we didn't know what we were going to do with it, and we've put it out on a little independent label. Yeah. Trying to do some gigs, you know. Yeah. But it's been... That... Yeah, how does that yeah, work? It's, been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been... made a noise. Um, how okay. does it work with um, a sort of, like, release thing? I guess you put it all on Spotify and Bandcamp and all of these kind of things. Is that yeah, yeah. So... Thing? We've been lucky enough. We've, we, it is, it is for a label. It's for a small German label called Legier, a good friend of ours. He, What's he's the put out, called, by the way, it is just Edda Lazy. So okay. it's, a, it's a self of titled, it's volume one. No, but you know, it's not called volume one. But. <laughs> it's a self titled, yeah. it's a self titled record. Eponymous, eponymous, is that the word? It, it, eponymous is the word. Yeah. 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 So yes, that came out in in March. So it's not been out very long. Yeah, but yeah, it's a, a very independent thing. Yeah, you know, pretty we, cool. we, we, I like the uh, sort of you know smoky atmosphere and uh, sort of yeah, it's vibey and cool. It's very sixtiesy. Yeah, it's sort of once we found what we felt was the sound of what was, Hannah was writing, and, and you know. What we both liked, we, it was it was quite. It, we had a path then. It was, but it was finding that it was. You know, when you play lots of different music and you like lots of different music, it's quite a hard thing to sort of focus on a record. Yeah. And I definitely wanted it to sound like one thing. It's easy to be eclectic, I think. Or you know, yeah. But you know, well, we work together a lot. Like we both like. I know you like records. It, it sounds like a record. You want to hear it as a record. I don't want to hear it as individuals songs and i know that the yeah. way that things are now we are listening to music as individual songs much more than ever yep i still like an album and i'm happy i can put our record on and that's what i'm you know yeah more, that's what i'm pleased about most i think it sounds like a record a cohesive body of work you know what i mean yeah and how did you guys <laughs> make it did is it all did you record it yourselves and you know, does the whole production yeah. process happen sort of in house, as it were? Yeah, yeah. It was all it was all done on a boat on on this boat in the back bedroom. It was quite a funny scenario. Of you know, I wouldn't say it was a. Uh, it wasn't produced in a way of 
thinking about how to record things. It was more about capturing ideas. Um, so sometimes, you know, I barely there'd be one mic on the drums. Um, you know, it wasn't about, I didn't set out to like sonically make something that was like a yeah. high end recording. It was just about capturing ideas. And then I was in, you know, my friend, Sean Lee was a producer. He encouraged me to just continue that way. I was going to get somebody else to produce it. And he said, well, it sounds good. It sounds good. And it sounds how you want it to sound. Just continue that way. So, and you've got drums on a boat like Dave Gilmore. Yeah, but I could only fit. A t- I use a child's bass drum, child, a kid's kit. Yeah, it's the only thing, fit- anything else, especially it wouldn't fit for the doorway, the big one. So, so it's, you know, it's full size snare, like a sixteen but, uh, think- bass or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but things even like there's there aren't a lot of fills in the drum parts because I didn't have enough room to set up the songs. <laughs> so you, it, you know, so it just makes you approach things in different ways. So the drums on the record for me on by themselves they're quite simplistic but they're groove based and other things do do the fills you know like there's, there's a give and take isn't there like depends on what record you're making if i was making an acdc style record it'd be yep. massive guitars straight up drums very little bass really in the mix you know it's all the you know, things that make the genres different you know in their production and in their sound so but yeah, it was an it was an interesting experience. I'd have the drums set up, I'd have everything set up, so I could just try things out. Really, it was a bit of a not yeah. knowing what I'm doing and yeah, throwing it all in. That sort of limited framework to work in. Yeah, causes you to create a certain thing. Well, it was it, it create an environment to work in, and then then you can express yourself. It's it, it, different for different people. For me, that's what I always have to do. I basically, you know, or is that. Or work with others because I, you know, my preference is to always collaborate. Yeah, obviously, I collaborated on this, but like even Jonathan Jeremiah and that work with this, we, you know, we collaborate a lot. It's the being in a room with someone else that plays differently to you is yeah. such a big thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the shit. Hard do it work. again. That was shit. Do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's the differences between you know. I always liked the sound of different people playing on a record. I found it quite hard. I played a lot of the instruments and all thing, and it was like, oh, that's, you know, in the past, we've gone all oh, no, because no, it sounds like you playing everything. You know what I mean? That I might sound like it. that, though? Well, uh, funny enough, I think I've had such breaks from playing, like, guitar in bands, and just I've been a bass player for a long time, playing that as my full. So m- my bass playing became its own thing, and there's something you it was different from a guitar playing. So I can, I can listen to it and go, actually, I do sound like they're, they're just two different bits of me now. Ah, okay. That's interesting. It never used to be that. It used, Cause I don't know when we used to play together, it's like I played bass. It just sounded like me playing the bass and yeah. it sounded like my guitar playing. <laughs> yeah. So the sort of things have definitely separated. So that was good, but still, yeah, it'd be nice to have others play. It was quite a weird experience, you know, cause you start, I don't know, you, you, you criti- critiquing everything in a weird way. Is it, oh, is that, I don't like my guitar playing. Does that work with the song? Or, or you know. Yeah. yeah only thing. I mean, that was, yeah. We, we also had that experience, I think, of like listening to your own stuff so much that you, you just lose oh, judgment. Well, it's, quite, it's a hard thing, isn't it? You know, but then there's a whole, and I, and I mix the record, but I, I, I like the mix process. That's the one bit I really like. Mm-hmm. But I definitely approached it in a way of, you know, probably not like a mix engineer. It was still still creating sound. So say if something didn't sound how I wanted it to sound, I made it sound the way I wanted it to sound. Yeah. You know, so which you're able to do, I think being being a, mu- a musician, that is a definitely a talent that you can bring to that because you're if you've got a sound in your head, you'll make it sound like that. Doesn't matter if it's after the fact. Yep. Whereas I think some technical people can't do that like if you're just an out-and-out engineer i don't know if you're hearing it's quite a my experience it's been quite hard to explain that to someone that's not yeah you know a musician that's terrible you're, 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 but you know what i mean and it's gonna cause a scandal now. <laughs> <laughs> engineer but not musician no, i didn't say that sizes engineers yeah <laughs> oh i love engineers uh you know, ones that fix boats no no <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's brilliant. So, uh, um, where where can people find the uh, Edelletsi stuff? 
Uh, so you can get it on Bandcamp. I think it's available on uh, Rough Trade, a bunch of sort of independent record stores. It's been distributed a little bit. So, yep. and you can go on the record company site, Ligier. Yep. L E G E R E, with some, you know, whatever they are. Yes. Lots yeah. Of yeah. Well, we'll put a link in the uh, in the comments thingy to all your stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And so yes. that's, that's sort of been out. And so do you get to uh, sort of perform that stuff as well? Is it hard getting gigs nowadays in sort of this this neck of the woods? Or It's definitely hard getting gigs because you know, not really. He's helped get the record out then and some sort of airplay. You know, they've, they've done a bit of plugging, so that's been great. And some that's some, a bit of press. But like gigs-wise, it's down to us to get them. You know, we don't have any management or anything like that. It's it's early days actually as a project. It's funny, like we've made a I think you know fairly accomplished record, but it's yeah. if it's a new thing, it's a new thing. It doesn't matter who you are or, or what part of your life you know where you are of your career. It's you know regardless, it's a new thing, and it is still you, you've got to do all the social media. You've got to try and get it out there, and it's a hard thing. Yeah, are you guys doing that yourselves? We are. Yeah, it's a pain, it's a painful hard thing, and we're not particularly good at it. Never been good at it, but. Uh, Terrible. Still not my world. I know that's you know everyone's you know young musicians are encouraged to be able to do it all, but you know I think the reality is, and it still probably is the reality that some of us aren't equipped to do to do these things. You know, and that's why there is a record label. I know there's lots of talk about oh the death of record labels and stuff, but like mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I think they are needed. It's good to have it, someone yeah doing this marketing business. Yeah, it it just needs to be done in the right way where people aren't getting ripped off. Where it's you know it's fair, you know there's you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of there's some great uh, interviews with Prince talking about it. You know, from, I don't I can't remember that from the two thousands. He has some really insightful things to say about it. You know, mm-hmm. you know like it's, yeah, we don't need record labels, but at the same time, you need people who can do the equivalent of a record label. You need people who are good at those jobs and are good at promoting. You know. Yeah. I'm not good at promotion. It's just, you know, you dem- saying, look at me, I'm really good. Check this out. Look at me. Um, you have to want to do yeah. that. Yeah. It, 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 so, yeah, there's a lot I could say about it already because it, it does depend on the individual. Some people are great at that and they can also write their music and record their music and do it. Good for them. That's brilliant. But you know, that's not all of us. And it shouldn't be, there should be pressure for everyone to be able to do that you succeed as a musician because it's that's nothing to do with music is it really you know no, no, the joy of playing an instrument thing. and the love of this is music yeah you know they, they, they don't go hand in hand naturally I don't, I don't really believe that but you know you, you, do, but you, you, know, you do your best but. yeah I remember working with certain musicians who, who have felt so uncomfortable yeah. about selling they wouldn't even mention they had something available and so on. But a lot of the time is it's it's weird and difficult to to yeah, just promote yourself. It's a it's a, it's a funny business. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, you know, people don't realise it's it's, it's this there's there's a embarrassment to it all as well, isn't it? It's like a lot of people make their own make their records right and, ne- and never listen to them after they've made it. So many people I work with, they put so much time into making their record and then and then once it's done, they don't ever listen to their own record. Yeah. It's so I don't not quite sure what it is, but it's it's a very common thing. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And then it's very. Cool. It's just that, yeah, the, the the idea of the the artistic process once you're done going through all that uh, the whole rigmarole or whatever the intensity of trying to produce something that you feel good about. Yeah, I, I totally understand how you just don't really want to know at that point. And that's where then this whole intense process in theory is supposed to kick in, where you then, you know, you're doing all the yeah. all the fanfare and all of that. Well, that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, have you got any sort of gigs lined up then in, uh, I don't know, do, do you gig around the UK with Ed Aledzi or? Um, yeah, uh, we've, got, we've played, in Manchester. played in Manchester in a couple of weeks. We're doing a little oh, gig cool. in, in, what's the venue? We've got the venue we're playing now. It's not Gulliver's. It's what it's oh, maybe we have to put it in the link, but we you know we are you know, we've got we've got the gigs coming up. You're not on the, the sales pitch thing, David. No, see, that like, it's a prime example. Yeah. But we are doing a few gigs, yeah. We've, we've just been getting up and running again because we um made the record and it came out and then I, me and Hannah, 
you know, my partner, we we had a baby, so things been a bit quieter. So we're getting back on the horse, as it were, <laughs> with that, you know. And we're writing another record at the moment, so just going to crack on and record some more music. Really, you know. Yeah. Russ, it's all about that. Just keep making some music. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I just yeah, I haven't been playing very much or haven't been recording. Um, yeah, it'd be quite nice to do something. You go through phases. It's it's a difficult thing. So for me, like the recording and writing, I don't do it for ages, and then I and then I do it and have a concentrated period of it because I've always found myself playing in a live sphere. It's always been somehow that's what people want me to do as a, as a as a working musician. Yeah, and that's sort of that's where I'm most kind of I don't know happy, but I, it's familiar. And so it takes you, energy to get in the studio and to write and to focus my mind in a different way. So yeah. I've got, I've got down a rabbit hole to do that. Do you have to kind of make yourself then, or does that happen spontaneously? I have to make myself do that. Yeah, definitely. It's not something I, it doesn't, I don't naturally, it doesn't come natural to, to do that. I have to go, right, come on. So this week I'm going to sit every day and write some songs. Yeah, or at least try. You know I mean, I think that's the thing nothing comes out nothing comes out but uh definitely uh, an intent and then you do you get in a groove you, you know you but you do need to find time for me like that that was a lockdown for a lot of people it was a difficult time it was i didn't find, find it as difficult I, it, it was a respite from other stuff um yeah. you know obviously it was the stress of <laughs> what was going on but yeah. in, in terms of like musically you know was able to make you know write a record with, with, with somebody which i hadn't done for a long time so yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's really interesting I, I i feel like there is this kind of weird class of people among whom i am one as well for whom that period was actually a sort of godsend um and it's weird mm. sort of a lot yeah of people had a very very shitty time yeah they did yeah like, yeah you, you were guilty. Guilty. yeah yeah, yeah. But I don't mind talking about it because the reality is some people did find it really hard and some people it was a it was it was uh like a reset. It was a it gave you perspective, and that's not in a, you know, that's not ignoring how all the negative stuff that was going on. It gave you perspective. Yeah. You know. And, you know, if you were a busy person, stopping and like like for me, like I slept, started sleeping again, started to actually, you know, because when you, you know, you know, you know, you're playing gigs and stuff, and if you do it regularly, you've got a very kind of strange way of yeah, living your life. The rhythms are all off, aren't they? Yeah, like a, a nocturnal life is quite odd, isn't it? You know, doing lots of gigs and yeah, yeah, you just don't, you know, you, you you're wired, aren't you? It's adrenaline. There's so many things going on. So to have things stop and then you'd be forced, basically, you know, I personally was forced into going, okay, I'm gonna what's going on what we're doing every day you know yeah because there was there was one thing to there wasn't anything to aim for so you, you know yeah. you either created things to aim for or you became aimless uh you know and didn't do anything yeah and you know started baking i don't know yeah it was it was beautiful so I, I didn't do that it was great i mean i lost half my students yeah. overnight but then got into like the online teaching thing which was brilliant and yeah there was so much yeah. peace it was so good. I'm still hanging on to that to some extent. Um, but it was, there was less pressure. You know, it's one thing I've noticed because I've, I've got back into, you know, it took a while, but obviously ended up playing in a pretenders. It's all everything's ramped up to where it sort of used to be for me. And it's, it's quite stressful. It's a, you know, it's you're, you're, you are running at a different tempo once you're, because it, it, it has its own tempo. You're, you're involved in something that it, it happens and you, you go along yeah, with it. You're, you know, you're, yeah. Oh God, much bigger. And you, and you, you're, you're, you know, it's got a perpetual motion that you're in. Yeah. So you, and you go with it or you don't, don't go with it, you know, yeah. it's the nature of nature of it. So yes, I'd like to gain back a little bit of that kind of, you know, not just being pulled along by the force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm clinging to that myself at the moment, but I don't have to worry about, you know, being called, uh, you know, to go to whatever New York or something. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, it's very interesting that, you know, the, the, the need for, for a bit of space and, um, that, yeah, it's good. It's good if you get it, I think, because when you're, I suppose in your sort of current position, you like when the pretenders aren't 
on tour, you're still so then you're still pursuing other band commitments and so on. Well, actually, it's what's happened with the business. It's, it's got so busy that I haven't been able to do the other stuff. All right, okay. It's really taken on. I think there's it's a, it's, a, it's you know the band the current lineup is there's been a bit of a resurgence with it actually, and yeah. you know so that that's quite a difference. And, and I think we're working towards working on a new record next year as well. So oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So. Yeah, there's a there's a new energy, so we're you know, we're really busy from next week until like the end of October. It's pretty flat out. So, huh. oh, okay. Well, that's yeah, good. So, it's good to be on the. Have Have you recorded with them before in the studio or? Yeah, I, I ended up. I sort of I started playing in the band at the tail end of making the record that came out last year. <laughs> so I played on two songs. That was great. I got to be you know involved at the end. And from what I heard from them, from everyone else, the record started out as one type of thing, and then it totally evolved into a you know rock and roll record. It didn't start like that, and then so I think I came into it at a, at a good time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. And yeah. and uh, okay, I mean maybe that's a kind of reasonable place to wrap things up for today. Yeah, and um, I think it's good. we've had kind of a good overview of 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 what's involved in like just being a busy musician, I guess. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we can think about having a chat sometime about like how you noodle around with the guitar more specifically. Um, yeah. I don't know. Oh, I, was, I had in mind that I was going to say to you, you know, what's, what's your advice for anybody who wants to become like a, a working musician. And then at some point I thought, no, maybe that's a bit trite, but maybe to finish off, can I maybe touch on that sort of subject? If there's a sort of, bullet point like what are the things that you would recommend somebody uh who's interested in like a working life as a musician and whatever, whatever level really because you've you've done it all you've done the sort of working men's club with sussex pub gigs um yeah you know. well the thing is you, yeah it's, it's, there's there's all the stuff that everyone talks about you know like uh, you know other famous mission whoever they'll be talking about it like you you do whatever gig you can do that's that's definitely true you, you, you know, if you want to do a gig, you do it. It doesn't matter whether you're getting paid or not. You do it because you want to do it. Yep. That's that's very important when, you, when you're starting out playing because that's why you play. You know, you're not, you know, I didn't set out to do it as a job. Mm -hmm. it, it was always about wanting to make some music. And then maybe if people liked it and you had some success and, Great, great, great. Obviously, you know, because nobody wants to work in Sainsbury's. No offense to the people that do work in Sainsbury's, but I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to work behind the till. And I've done that job, yeah. you know, as a means to do, you know, to yeah. facilitate music, you know. Uh, but right, so the step one is just get out and play as much as you can. Yeah, it's got to be that. It always has to be that. Um, uh, and then if you do start gaining some traction and you're and you're getting stuff you know always be on time be be no know, know your stuff know know the songs and and not just that when you when you when you do perform give it your best doesn't matter if you make a mistake doesn't none of that stuff matters because it's not seen if you if you if you're always on time you're reliable and you're and you are part of it you're putting yourself in something that's always seen and that's always appreciated and that, and that means that's 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 what it is to, to play music to be part of anything really like isn't it you know like put yourself into it if, you, if that's what you want to do put yourself into it yeah and then and then don't give in you know i'm i'm i don't know if some people might not agree with this but i'm a, i'm a i don't have a backup plan never had a backup plan yeah it was all all my eggs in in a basket they're still in that basket yeah um call it around off up a lady I played with for quite a few years called Catherine Williams. She said to me, when you're on the bus, just don't get off the bus. Stay on the bus. <laughs> Other people will get off the bus. Yeah. Stay on the bus. I know I tell everyone this. This is, always, this is my little thing. So thanks, Kath. You know, you stay on the bus. Yeah. Stay on the bus. Yeah. You know. Unless you don't want to. It's fine. You can ring the bell and get off. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know. Yeah. If you want to. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, I, that resonates. I think, but he did sort of, if you want to stay being a musician, you've got to stay in it. It's it's because there's so many people doing it as well. You know, you can't, can't pack up. Cool. Okay. So I'm waving it. So. Yeah. That's, 
Is that the uh, <laughs> the offspring? Yeah. Oh, and, and the message. Yeah. Um. So yeah, good. Okay. So that's yeah. Those are the key principles. Go out and play yeah. a lot. Turn up. Do your utmost. Play play your best every time, and just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, they're really simple things, but they're, you know, they're quite. And do it because you want to do it, you know, because that's the thing. Like people can see if, you, if you're just, you know, I don't know. There's things are quite transparent in the real world, really, when it comes down to it. The relationships with people, aren't they? You know, yeah. if you play in a band with someone, it's especially you, when you tour, you get to know people, they get to know you. It's a very close quarters kind of relationship. It's like living with someone. So you very soon know whether it works or not. So yeah. it would just require that kind of honesty. Honestly, yeah, that's merely, you know. <laughs> yes. No, no. Good. Okay. Be honest. That's that's where we can wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much for that. Dave Page, bass player with The Pretenders and everything uh, with Ed Alessi, um, except for lead singer, I guess. Does Anna play the guitar as well on that? She plays piano on a piano on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah, all. I, I've now made it not a slick wrapping up thing. No, no, it's good. <laughs> okay. Anyway, everybody, like, check out Edelezi. Really, I'm going to put all the links to all of that on the uh, in the comments below. And uh, that's it. I'll just do my sign off thing, which is thank you very much for watching this. Thank you, David, for speaking to me today. And uh, you lot can go off and practice. <laughs>